Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to Family Talk. I'm your host, Dr. James Dobson, and today we're going to be talking about an issue that I believe is at the heart of the crisis our families are facing today. Fatherlessness is pandemic in this country. About 50%, if you can believe this, about 50% of the children in America will go to sleep without their biological father in the home. And 25% of those are boys. And uh, I could cite many statistics and may do so as we go along today. Uh, But I could talk about the impact that um, this lack of fathers has on children and our society. And uh, we'll get into some of that later. For now, I just want to say that almost every social ill faced by American children is related to the lack of dads, fatherlessness, and particularly those that are committed to their families. Poverty, educational achievement problems, crime, drug use, and all of those connected things are related to the plight of fatherlessness. As I wrote uh, some time ago in my book, Bringing Up Boys, Quote, the future of Western civilization depends on how we handle the crisis of fatherlessness. And I believe that's more true now than it was then. The numbers are disheartening, and it's uh, not time to just wave a white flag. we got to do something about it. And my guest today is committed uh, to the task of uh, saving as many fatherless boys as possible and to change their futures. His name is John Smith Baker. We're of like mind and like hearts uh, on many things. John, I'm so glad you're here. Oh, thank you so much. It's a privilege and an honor, and you've just been such a hero of mine growing up and reading your book, Bringing Up Boys, when I became a father and had a son and looked into his eyes and wondered, how do I do this since I didn't have a father to show me? How do I do it better than my dad did? That's right. In fact, your dad abandoned your family before you were born, didn't he? That's correct. My mom was pregnant with me, and I had a three-year-old sister. He actually encouraged my mom to have an abortion and kill me because I was not wanted by him and thankfully had a strong mom. You know that for a fact. I do. I do. My mom told me and and I even asked my dad. Why would she tell you that as a little boy? Well, she didn't tell me that as a little boy. This was in adulthood. Yeah. When I asked and... uh, you know, I, I was seeking truth and wanted to understand the circumstances of why and when he left, and she shared that with me. Well, when we met before and talked, I was touched, deeply touched by what you went through as a child because you were a, a vulnerable, tender kid, weren't you? I mean, some boys go through fatherlessness and are not affected by it as much. Most are, but some aren't. But you felt it. You knew it. You were lonely. You longed for a relationship with a dad. And it didn't get better as the time went on. Describe that for us. Yeah, I mean, I didn't really understand, but I knew I was hurting and I was broken in a lot of ways. I mean, looking back, I just knew something wasn't right. It wasn't the way it should be. I remember my mom telling me that uh, I didn't even speak until I was five years old. And she took me to specialists because she thought I had a problem or whatever else. And they tested my IQ and said, no, your son is fine, but he's just quiet. I don't know what all the reasons were, but uh, I just remember her telling me that. And uh, How early do you remember that other kids had a dad and you didn't? I would say it's probably around six years old. You know, my mom worked nights and I was shuffled around to daycares and thankfully I had a little a grandma who took took some of that burden off. But I remember my mom leaving and, and me just screaming and begging her not to leave me at this institutional daycare because I, I just knew that wasn't the way it was supposed to be. I was already lonely and now 
you know, now I'm pretty much lonely 24 hours because my mom had to work evenings to pay the bills and we barely got by. So I didn't see her during the day and I was sleeping at night. So I didn't seem like I never saw who anybody. Took care, who took care of you? Well, I mean, in the evening I was sleeping and my grandmother would come over or a babysitter or somebody. And then during the day I was at a daycare. So from a family perspective, I mean, I look back and I never saw anybody, it seemed like, to me. You know, many people fail to realize just what impact that has on boys. Uh, boys are not born knowing what it means to be male. And it's interesting how God designed us, but girls know what it means to be girl, a girl and then to grow up to be a woman. They understand that role. Boys don't. They have to be taught it. And uh, when uh, there's not a loving dad on the scene, something's missing, something's aching inside, uh, something longs for. That's right. I remember uh, seeing Jonathan Winters. You remember the comedian Jonathan Winters? Yes, I, do. I think he's gone now. Yeah. I remember a moment when he was being honest and he was uh, being interviewed and he was very serious. He wasn't trying to be funny. And uh, he said, when I was a child, my mother and father got a divorce, and we never saw my dad again. And he said that boys teased him about not having a dad. That was a different day. You know, the divorce was not so common. And he said uh, that the boys would make fun of him and say he didn't have a dad. And he said, I'd beat him up. I'd fight him. But then when they weren't looking, I would go behind a tree and cry. Mm, can, can you imagine? And he said, this is the key line, all of my humor is a response to sorrow. Well, I, I explain it to when I talk now that the father-son relationship is the foundation of the world. I never really understood yeah. that until I became saved. And when that's broken, the, the soul is broken and hurt. And my experience is that I believe the child – has a decision to make when that happens. They decide to fight in a weird way for their father's affection, or they flee from it and they rebel. And that's why so many of them, most of them flee from it. They become angry and bitter, and they rebel against the system, and they get in a lot of trouble in a lot of ways. I tried to fight for my father's affection, so I decided that I would be the perfect kid, get good grades, excel in sports. So why wouldn't my father love me? Why wouldn't he come back? Was there something wrong with me? Yeah. Is, did you have that thought? Yeah. Well, I, I said, you know, if there was something wrong with me, I was going to fix it. And so I have this striving gene in me now, it seems like, that I, I want to be perfect and all that. And, and that's unhealthy, too. And I explained to it that it's just as destructive. You know, so 85 percent of these kids get adjudicated some way. And then the other 15% become perfectionist nut jobs like I, that I had to win or achieve everything at all costs. So I would, one, feel worthy, and two, maybe my father would come back. Yeah. And, and it's hard because, you know, if I wasn't saved when I was, when I started having children, thank the Lord he saved me when he did, I have no doubt I would have probably abandoned my children through divorce because I would put career and fame and ambition trying to fill that hole in me above being a father to my children and a good husband. You and and others call that a father wound. Mm -hmm. Explain what that means. Well, I'm sure it means some things to, differently to different people, but for me, it really was – I felt confused and alone because nobody was there to shepherd me into manhood. Compounding that, I would have the bitter response from my mom talking bad about my dad. I would have society tell me that I didn't need a dad, pat me on the head and said, big boys, don't cry. You'll get over it. So I suppressed this hurt and anger deep down inside because I thought, well, something's wrong with me because I know I'm broken, but everybody's telling me I'm not. So I just knew that something was wrong, and I didn't really know how to address it other than try and win and do and achieve things so I would feel worthy. Did you get acquainted with him later? Did you ever meet him? Did you yeah, ever? that's the other thing. He just lived across town. 
He just lived across town. Did and he have nothing to do with you? Well, not in the early years. You know, my mom had to take him to jail to pay child support. He remarried, put his time into other kids. And so that compounds, that's salt in the wound. Not only did he leave, he was putting his time and energy into a new family. And so that just hurts. And then when I got a little older, he would promise to come pick me up and me and my sister and then not show. So that just picks the scab yeah. and, and it hurts you even more. Then every once in a while he would pick me up and then he'd drop me off at his new house and he would go play golf and I would be a stranger in a home. And I thought we were going to spend time together. So it's just all those compounding things that just drives that wound. You deep. know, when, when a man kind of responds in that way, uh, I always want to know what his childhood was like. What was his relationship with his dad? Do you know anything about your grandfather? I do. On, on my dad's side, yep. They were the son of immigrants and worked hard. And uh, it, it was sad because I would get glimpses of them in my life, but I didn't know them. When the divorce happens, you know, those extended family relationships get broken too. And so you don't even lose a dad. You lose a whole half of your yeah. family life, you know. So... In high school, when I was excelling in sports and stuff, he would try to come back and because I guess I was doing something special. And then, but then my mom and dad, they wouldn't even hang out together, to, like say at the football game. And they would, so I, I wouldn't know what to do at the end of the game. Do I walk to one and hurt the others? Or so I just walked in. So they didn't even sit together. No. So who do I go to? What do you do? You know, you put such strain and thought process and emotional strain on a young soul that you don't know how to deal with it. You know, it's it's really different for a girl, but it's hard for a girl, too, to oh, not have a, a father. Uh, and uh, a girl's self-esteem hangs precariously on a relationship with her dad. If he tells her she's pretty, if he tells her he loves her, if he builds her up, if he makes an investment in her, she feels good about herself. Uh, and if he doesn't, it's really hard for the mother to make up for that. And um, my wife surely grew up in the home of an alcoholic father. Right. And he was not a good man. Uh, he was okay when he was sober, but that wasn't very often. And he would uh, every Friday night uh, go to the bar and and drink up all the money. And mm -hmm. so they were just destitute. It was a really unbelievable uh, childhood of her own. Yeah. Fortunately, Shirley's mother was wise enough to get her two kids into an evangelical Sunday school. She wouldn't go because she was working six days a week, and she had to iron and clean and wash and do all the things to keep the family together. So she didn't go. So Shirley and John, as small children, Shirley was about five, um, went to this little church and a Sunday school teacher there told them about Jesus mm -hmm. and told Shirley about Jesus. And that made sense to her. And and the this Sunday school teacher said that Jesus was building a mansion for them. And they lived in this little lean-to. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it was really kind Special. of pitiful. And yet, because of that, Shirley and John are whole people mm -hmm. today. And uh, when Shirley was six, she went to an altar on her own. The only, I mean, she was down there by herself wow. and prayed and gave her heart to the Lord Praise God. and then learned to pray. And you can see that as a prelude to the National Day of Prayer, which uh, she has been yeah. uh, handling for 25 years. So the church can... Yes. make a huge difference. But you didn't have that either, did you? No, my mom always would call herself a Christian, I, looking back, you know, and I remember the first time I heard the name of Jesus, you know, I was young, but we were cuddled up on the only little heater we had in our house, and we were cold, and she, my mom was crying because she had no food in the refrigerator, and she was crying out to the name of Jesus. And I remember that's the first time I heard the name Jesus. Single no, moms. No one. There was no safety net. No. My grandmother was probably the only one that helped, but my mom was so prideful that she wouldn't tell people that she needed help. Do you remember being hungry? I do. Seriously hungry. 
Well, I can't say I was like starving like the pictures you see, you know, but I remember saying, well, we're not going to have dinner tonight. You know what I mean? But yeah. my mom worked two jobs. Strong woman. Thankfully, she was a strong woman. But, you know, she had to work. And she had to work and pay for daycare. And she didn't have a car, so she lived in a neighborhood she could walk to, you know, all those things that you do. And it's just tough. You know, it's not the way God intended it to be. Yeah. Fortunately, you were a good athlete. Yes. And that helps. That helps a boy. Uh, and yet it wasn't enough for you. I talked to you about this when you were in my office. You, it didn't make up for the fact that there was no dad over there cheering for you and hugging you when you made a touchdown or did something uh, you know, unusual. I, I, I was motivated by all the wrong reasons. I was motivated because I didn't want to deal with the fact that I was broken or hurting, and, and I wanted to find worth in my life. So the accolades that came with sports provided some level of worth, and I would have you know male coaches that spoke into my life yeah. in that regard, and I had somebody that I wanted to please, and I received some forms of affirmation in that process, you know. But looking back, you know, I did a lot of the things that I shouldn't do, you know, trying to find my manhood, yeah. you know, girlfriends and all those things, you know, I was. How do I know I'm a man? What does a man do? How does a man act? And all those things. And, you know, you just go on a search trying to find what it means to be a man versus somebody explain to you what a godly man is. You know, I I don't um, promote my own stuff a lot. I just don't feel that's what I'm here to do. But uh, my book, um, Bringing Up Boys, is written for families mm. that uh, have sons that are struggling along this way. And they really have not yet found uh, their sea legs underneath them. And there is a way to do this. And I've talked about the fact that if a father is not there and, frankly, a mother is not equipped uh, in her physiology and in her brain to teach a boy how to be a man, some people get irritated by my saying that, but there's the just truth. not. The man has to teach a man. Yes. And if there's not a father there, then there needs to be a father substitute. There needs to be a coach or a grandfather or somebody who can come in and relate to a boy. You had one, and his name was Uncle Bucky. I've read your story. Yeah, amen. Uncle Bucky, who amen. was that man, and what did he do for you? Yeah, thank the Lord for Uncle Bucky. He's my mom's brother, and he would come by and hang out. He would bring a ball and a glove and throw baseball, and I would say, you know, he, he would throw it to the moon and back so I could catch it. That's what it felt yeah. like. And to have a glimpse of a man and his roughness to me and how he spoke and that we would wrestle and we would go fishing and those kind of things just give me glimpses of hope of what a man, how he acted, how he talked, all those things. Because as you know, I mean, being raised by a mom, not only can he not teach you how to be a man, but honestly, there's additional wounds that are created. One's being overly bonded with your mom because too many things are hoisted upon your shoulders. And being overly bonded with your mom is not a good thing. And that creates a wound of you have to break, you have to leave, you got to, you know. So it, it is a compounding issue besides trouble you can get into, yeah. the emotional issues. But yeah, I'm very thankful for Uncle Bucky. And he was the one man in my life that stepped up and it was not a lot of time. And that's what I've encouraged people. It's not a lot of time. It's like a safety raft that somebody throws you that you can grab on and have a little bit of hope to get you through the years until your mind develops and your worldview and your perspective. So it helps you through the tough times. Mm -hmm. but, you know, I'm not able to uh, identify the people in what I'm about to tell you because it's very confidential. But an NFL coach and I sat down together uh, and uh, I was uh, in his training camp. I, I observed the relationship of the coaches to the men. These are big, burly dudes. And I, I met with this coach, and I asked him a question. I said, what is the difference 
in your players between those who had a father at home and those who didn't. He said it's night and day. And you'll be surprised by what he said. I, I say, explain what the difference is. And he said, if you want to get the best performance out of the men who didn't have fathers, you have to treat them like women. Are you kidding me? These guys on a football field are killing each other. And, and he said, well, they've grown up with women, mostly their mothers, their aunts, their grandmothers, and their school teachers have been women. They don't know how men think and how they act. And they're very, very sensitive. And he said, if you really want to build men, you have to recognize that sensitivity. And you don't make fun of them. You don't yell at them. You don't threaten them. You don't try to you know, get more out of them by yelling or b abusing them. You let them know you're on their team, and you put an arm around them, and you become a father to them, and everything changes. Isn't that interesting? That is amazing. That's can good you imagine? Insight, can good you? Insight. Yeah, you can see why I can't tell this story yep. um, with the people involved because these men would be very offended if you said you have to treat them like women. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean to be soft and not to expect the highest performance out of them, mm -hmm. but it does mean that you recognize that they think more like women because they've never had a man to teach them. I know. Well, I look back, and when my son was playing Little League, 8, 9, 10 years old, and I was the coach, even in Wyoming, in this little town, so, you know, God's country, as we used to call it, you know, out of the 10 boys we had on our team, you know, eight of them are fatherless in God's country. This is not the inner city. This is not the third world. We don't define fatherlessness in what I believe it should be. When a dad divorces and leaves, even if it's across the town, most of the time we don't call that kid fatherless. But that kid is fatherless in his mind because somebody is not fulfilling the God-given roles of fatherhood in their life. We've been talking to John Smith Baker about fatherlessness, and he has experienced it. We need to move right on next time into the ministry that has grown out of that. Uh, because it's called Fathers in the Field, and our time is gone. Uh, we can just tease it a little bit here. But okay. God has taken your father wound yes. that you experienced as a child and has turned that into a ministry for other boys who are hurting. And we're going to talk about that next time. Thanks, John, for being with us. I love talking you. to you. Thank you very much. And we'll pick it up next time. Okay, thank you. You've been listening to John Smith Baker, the founder of Fathers in the Field, a Christ-centered mentoring ministry for fatherless boys, with Dr. James Dobson here on Family Talk. I'm Roger Marsh. You know, you could hear the pain in John's voice as he described the fact that his own father had not only abandoned the family before he was born, but actually advocated for John to be aborted. That father wound motivated him to find his worth in athletics. Well, thank God that John came to Christ at the age of 40. And in the power of the Holy Spirit, he was able to forgive his father. That's the freedom that fatherless boys, no matter their age, need to experience from the weighty burden of unforgiveness. Now, to learn more about John Smith Baker and his book, The Great American Rescue Mission, or the Christ-Centered Mentoring Ministry, Fathers in the Field, please visit our broadcast page at drjamesdobson.org. That's drjamesdobson.org forward slash broadcast. Now, Dr. Dobson, of course, is continuing to work on his latest book. He's enjoying the Southern California sunshine with his bride, Shirley, and he'll be back in the studio this May. But before we go, I want to tell you about a very special premium resource that Dr. Dobson has created for families of all ages and in all stages of life. It's the eight DVD set called Building a Family Legacy. This collection contains eight hour-long films based on some of Dr. Dobson's best-selling books and teachings, including 
Bringing Up Boys, Love for a Lifetime, and more. Dr. Dobson's wisdom and humor in the Building a Family Legacy series will help strengthen your marriage and give you insight into raising your own children. Now, to receive your copy of the Building a Family Legacy 8 DVD box set, drop us a line at drjamesdobson.org or call us at 877-732-6825. We'll be happy to send you a copy as our way of thanking you for your gift of any amount in support of the ministry of the James Dobson Family Institute today. And please keep in mind, a box set with eight DVDs in it typically has a retail price of $50 or more. So give generously when you call or visit us online. Again, go to drjamesdobson.org or call us at 877-732-6825. That's 877-732-6825. We are here for you 24-7. Be sure to join us again tomorrow to hear part two of John Smith Baker's powerful conversation with Dr. Dobson entitled Rescuing Fatherless Boys. For everyone here at Family Talk, I'm Roger Marsh. Thanks for listening. This has been a presentation of the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute.